Um, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our cyber seminar series and um, cyber water community. I am Nicoletta Cristia, and I am coordinating Water Hack Week and the Water Hack Week cyber seminar series on behalf of the University of Washington and the University of Washington eScience Institute. I am here with Tony Canistra. And Tony is a PhD student in the Department of, of Biology here at the University of Washington. He is um, very interested in data-driven research in his field and collaborating with the eScience Institute. And um, thank you, Tony, for giving the today's um, cyber seminar titled um, Visualization of uh, Water Spatial Data Sets. Great. Well, thanks, Nicoletta. Um, Hi everybody, as Nicoletta said, my name is Tony. Um, I use the tools that I'm about to sort of give you guys a whirlwind tour of every day in my work. So I um, am hopeful that their utility will, you will find them just as useful as I do. Um, for those of you who are new to Python, some of the things that we're gonna be going through today may seem confusing in advance to you, um, and that's okay. One of the things that, uh, is really cool about this group is that people come from different uh, levels of, of knowledge and experience, but hopefully that you'll be able to get up to speed um, with the rest of the tutorials that are scheduled for this uh, cyber seminar series for Water Hack Week. Um, if you do have specific uh, questions, we're gonna just ask that you save them until the end, and then we'll try to go through a couple of them. It's gonna be tempting to wanna ask very specific, like, wait, how does that work questions? And those were probably um, best served in a different format. So if you want to ask those kinds of questions, you can send us an email and we can try to help you out. Or um, there are other resources available online for you. Many of the tutorials that I'm going to be teaching today are all fully written out and available online. They're linked in this uh, to a place where you can find them. Um, so you're going to be able to go read through them and take and uh, actually execute the code on your own um, to spend time learning about what's going on. So. Um, just want to say all of that. If you get lost or get confused, don't worry too much about it. Um, try to focus sort of on the high-level ideas. Speaking of high-level ideas, um, I wanted to just give a, a scope for what we're going to be doing today. Um, as it says in this, so this is a, I don't know if anyone has taken a software carpentry workshop before, um, but this is uh, a lesson in the format of software carpentry workshops. Every um, Every page here is called an episode in the lesson. You can access this page right now on the internet by going to waterhackweek.github.io slash visualization, and you'll be looking at the same page that I'll be looking at. Um, so the purpose of this tutorial is to foster a working knowledge of geospatial visualization tools in Python, and to give you guys an a, uh, exposure to the wide landscape of what's possible, um, both programmatically, like using uh, programmatic tools, which we're going to be focus on, focusing on today. And also there's a section in this tutorial on using other uh, tools like um, like GIS software and even uh, data visualization tools like Tableau to do your geospatial data visualization. Um, I'm going to start off by clicking on this introduction lesson here, which is just a, um, a way to motivate some some understanding of why one might want to care about making your visualizations appealing. Because the, as I wrote in the abstract for this um, tutorial, visualization is really not only a tool for demonstrating what you've discovered, but can also be a really excellent way to understand things that you might not even know exist yet. There are visualizations when made um, intelligently can really demonstrate aspects of your data that maybe you didn't have a good appreciation for prior to actually looking at it. I'm sure you guys have all had experience with this. All you have to do is make a map uh, to really see some dimensions of your data that you maybe didn't see just by looking at a, a tabular format or something like that. Um, when I do this tutorial in person, I often have people sort of ask, I ask what is visualization before I show these slides? So you're getting sort of a, a different view of this. But um, at a very high level, sort of in an academic sense, Jeffrey here is a researcher here at the University of Washington who studies data visualization. And um, his course ha goes into some of the history of data visualization. And here are some, some things that I pulled out of it um, that I thought were really interesting. Visualizing data is a way to transform symbolic into the geometric. So turn something that symbolizes an idea into a, a shape that symbolizes the same idea. Um, a good visualization helps us think. It finds artificial memory that supports our natural means of perception, that is looking at things. It's a good way to actually do um, 
to do computation in your brain by looking at an image can really be a powerful tool. Um, and that's sort of what this third quote here is supporting, is it amplifies cognition. So really, it's not we're not just going to be making maps today. I mean, that is what we're going to be doing. But um, there are a lot of reasons to think really hard about how you're portraying your information, not only to demonstrate results to someone, but also um, to sort of help yourself. Um, I wanted to demonstrate one really great example of a geospatial data visualization, which is very old. Um, this was made in 1864 by a, a cartographer named Charles Minard. Um, this map demonstrates coal exports from England, um, or actually maybe it's Europe. I think it's Europe. I can't remember now, um, to all around the world. And you really, by just looking very uh, very briefly at this map, you get a global picture of the amount, the relative amounts of coal that have been moved from Europe to all over the world in 1864. Think about all the other ways you could demonstrate this information. You could have a table, you could have, you could you know, write it in paragraph form, but immediately only after about two or three minutes or two or three seconds, really, you've gotten a, a you know, sense that wow, European coal exports are really global, and they go in varying degrees all around the world. Um, so this is an example of sort of the power of a cartographic uh, data visualization. Um, there's another fun one here, which is, uh, this is a cartographic, this is actually a map um, demonstrating Napoleon's Russian campaign in 1812, also by Charles Menard. This one uh, is demonstrating the, um, the si relative size of the both retreating and advancing army. Um, you can see that it starts on the left-hand side of the map, and uh, as it gets to Moscow and then returns, as moving over to the to the right, it's going to Moscow, and then the black color is returning. The thickness of the line represents the number of troops that survived in the army of the as it will return. So you can see that uh, the over time, as the troops moved from one place to another, there significant numbers of them were lost. And as you see um, on the bottom, there's actually a map, a sorry, a chart of temperature. The reason why so many troops died uh, were that it was very, very cold. Um, and so this is another actual cartographic data visualization representing a physical movement of people across the landscape, and then a corresponding data that has to do with uh, their eventual demise. So, just a couple of motivating um, examples to talk about to sort of expand your idea of what cartographic data visualization can look like. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on here. We're gonna start off with a really central idea in cartographic data visualization, and, and this is really generalizable. So I know we're talking about Water Hack Week here, and we're gonna get to some, uh, some hydrographic data sets in just a minute, but I wanted to start with something very general that applies to all sorts of uh, uh, data visualization challenges that have to do with data points that exist on the Earth. Um, and that is the idea that the Earth is round, right? So you can see this example here. This is an orange with the Earth drawn on it. If you want to make the Earth flat to fit on your computer screen, you have to make some compromises, right? The particular uh, person here who cut this orange up so that they could fit the whole surface of the orange on a flat plane, like this piece of paper or your computer screen, had to make some choices about where they chose to cut the orange, right? This is known as a map projection. The way you cut apart the orange of the globe coordinates that exist on the sphere of the Earth and make them uh, coordinates that exist on a two-dimensional plane so that we can look at them on a piece of paper or a computer. This projection here is actually a known entity. It's called the good homologous projection. Um, you, can, you can look this up if you want to click on that link. A funny little orange example it is uh, to the extent that you can be accurate on an orange is the actual projection. Um, so basically all I'm saying is everything that has been uh, is written here. Um, but there's a couple of sort of interesting examples. Cartographic projections interesting is that you have um, you have to understand the trade-offs of your projection and overlay that with what you're trying to communicate. So, for example, um, certain
distortion. You can tell that by the size of the rectangles in the map. And you can see that Greenland is considerably smaller when you compare it to the mainland United States. So these are examples of things that you want to think about when you're thinking about choosing a map projector. For most cases, your field is going to have a standard projection that's used, and you're not really ever going to have to think about it. However, for the most part, um, if you have to think about it, it's a good idea to be to do a little research to dis, to determine what it is that that your particular projection choice are going to um, are going to have on the way your data is displayed. Um, while we're talking about projections, um, there there happens to be an organization. This is going to be relevant later. Uh, there happens to be an organization known as the European Petroleum Survey Group, which is a brief G, and they have um, designated themselves as the canonical authority on global map projections. What that means is that the EPSG assigns a number to every known projection that is possible. And then you can go to their website, which is epsg.io, and you can find any projection. Um, so if you need to determine, um, if you need to learn about a projection, or if you want to um, find a projection for a given location on the Earth, some projections are very specific to very specific places. Um, you can use this website to sort of look them up. They're a convenient way to reference projections in a programmatic way, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I'm not gonna get into this, but I would highly recommend that you click on this link where it says see here for a nice visualization of different projections. Um, if I'll just show you what it looks like. This is a great way to compare map projections. So as I was saying, it tells you what the distortion is. So if you're looking for like a very low area uh, projection, with uh, some particular scale parameters, you can it'll suggest a projection for you. You can also choose a projection and see what it looks like. You can see that there are some very weird uh, projections out there. That's all I'm gonna say about really get in the weeds on this. Um, as I wrote here, this sounds complicated. It is complicated, but for the most part, you're gonna have software that's gonna be handling this for you. And that's what we're gonna talk about uh, next. Okay, let's just make sure this everything loaded here. Great. All right, so um, getting away from some of the high-level conversation here, I want to dig deep into one uh, software package that's available on with uh, for Python that really can take away a lot of the difficulties of taking um, a set of coordinates and projecting them for you. So there's this package called CartoPy. Um, which exists for Python. You can uh, download it through all of the all software on one Python, which you guys will learn about later on in the tutorial series. Um, and CartoPy is a package which provides a set of tools for creating projection-aware geospatial plots using Python's standard plotting package. So if you're ever if you're familiar with Python, you know that one of the standard ways to plot things in Python is using a um, package called matplotlib. And the reason why it's called matplotlib is because it uh, originally sort of originated in MATLAB plotting. So people who are familiar with MATLAB can transfer their fact become the canonical plotting package in Python as well. Um, CartoPy is a sort of a bolt-on package to, to matplotlib that allows you to use your standard lingo for matplotlib, but have projection-aware plots. That means have plots that realize that they're plotting spatial data and so you can specify a projection for both your source data and the projection of your plot, and you get a plot with the data already having been transformed from its source projection into the you hope to be plotting in, and it does all of that transparently or sort of behind the scenes for you. Um, so there are a couple, two, there are two really big modules that are relevant in CartoPy. The first is the CRS package or module within CartoPy. Um, you can access that via cartopy.crs. And this is the, CRS stands for Coordinate Reference System, which is just another way to say projection. Um, and these, this module is where um, CartoPy gets a lot of its muscle in terms of being able to understand and project data. Um, the features data is a really convenient way for both accessing geospatial data files, which um, I personally don't use it for. There are other tools that I like better for that. But it also has a convenient set of data loaders that can bring in 
you know, like coastlines or borders or rivers or big features that you might want to add to a map, which make quick uh, geospatial data visualization pretty simple. Um, so we're going to utilize both of these sort of central building blocks today. Now, this is code that if you've ever plotted and anything in Python is going to look very familiar to you. This is sort of what you have to do in Python if you want to make a very simple plot. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm setting up a set of axes, which is the sort of central part of any plot. Data is plotted on axes. I'm going to create a scatter plot with random data, x and y. I'm going to plot that onto the axis. You actually don't need this. This is redundant. should have deleted that. We're going to set the title of the axes of x and set a label of y on the y, y axis. And here's the plot that we get. Very simple. Now the reason why I demonstrate this to you is because um, there's very there's really only one significant difference between this plot up here and a geospatial plot. Before I show you what it looks like, I want you to imagine that instead of x and y coordinates, we have latitude and longitude coordinates. So you've got a bunch of data points that are that each have a, a latitude coordinate and a longitude coordinate. the CRS module in Cartopy, and we're going to import this feature module from Cartopy as well. I'm going to give them short names so I don't have to type the whole thing. That, all that does is just allow me to reference Cartopy.crs with a shorter name. And notice, this is the exact same line as before, but all I'm doing, I'm saying, give me a set of axes that are in the CRS, or in the coordinate reference system called Mercator. So there's a projection known as the Mercator projection. And I am just specifying that I want my plot to end up in the Merc So I'm letting Matplotlib know that there's something called a projection and that I'm using the Mercator version of the projection. And then, as I mentioned earlier, inside the Cartopy feature module, there's a, um, a member called Coastline. I can use that with the add feature function of the axes, which adds a coastline parameter to the map. I'll set a title and then I'll show it. And here's our map. So what this is doing under the hood is that it's downloading um, coastline data from the Natural Earth data set, which is available online. That's what cf.coastline is doing. It's adding that feature to the map. Features are unique because they already know what coordinate reference system they're in. So because, um, because Matplotlib knows about our destination projection and because this uh, coastline knows about its source projection, um, Cartopy under the hood is doing any sort of necessary transfers of data types from one projection to another, and then we get this plot here. Okay, um, but let's say I don't want to do the Mercator projection. Let's say I want to do the Lambert conformal projection because I'm a meteorologist and that's the projection that my community projects in. Notice that this is exactly the same code. The only difference is that I've changed this destination projection that my, that my map is going to be in. And here's my new map. Same input data. The only difference is that the projection in the destination has changed. So the map projection has changed. We can do um, an example here in Washington. So what I've done here is I've defined a couple of variables. This variable is the EPSG code for the Washington North projection. This is a projection that defines uh, a set of coordinates for the north half of Washington. This projection is a projection that defines coordinates for the south half of Washington State. Um, this is a set of, this is a bounding box that represents Seattle. This is a bounding box that represents Washington. That's just a pair of latitude, longitude coordinates. And here's, what we're gonna do here is we're going, to, we're going to set up a figure. This time, I only had to do this because I wanted to make it a little bit larger than the default. This is an optional line. All I wanted to do is just increase the size of the figure. I'm going to set up my axes, and this time, I start EPSG function, and I'm going to give it the Washington North variable. So basically, that's equivalent to me, say, me saying, go look up in the EPSG database the number 2926, and then return the parameters that define that projection, and then set the axes with that. I'm going to set the title to the map. I'm not going to set the extent so we can see the full extent of the projected space. 
I'm going to add this states feature. You don't have to worry too much about that. It's almost equivalent to uh, the, the coastlines features, just a couple more lines. We're going to get into that in the next, uh, the next part of the tutorial. And I'm going to use this function called annotate, which is a function that allows you to put text on any matplotlib plot. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, put the words Seattle at the XY location, Seattle Center, which is this latitude longitude coordinate. And what I have to tell the, um, I have to tell the, I have to tell Cardopy, rather, I have to tell Matplotlib that the coordinates are in a plate curve projection, which is the same as saying the coordinates are in a latitude longitude projection. You can ignore this as Matplotlib transform. That's actually not necessary anymore. And here's what we get. We get this map of the north projection of Washington, which is, this is the full extent of the Washington north projection. We've got some coastlines here from the states feature that we had above, and we've got a label at Seattle. Pretty simple. What I've done here is I've added the, this is called the TSOs indicatrix, which is just, it's this, um, it's this function as a part of uh, Cardopy that can actually give you these um, dots on a map, which are all the exact same area on the ground. So it's a way of um, determining spatial and aerial distortion of a projection. So we can see that here the dots are all pretty much the same size. We've got pretty little uh, spatial distortion here, or like aerial distortion. But we do have a little bit of uh, spatial distortion because the lines are curved a little bit, the lines across here. Anyway, we can do the same for the south projection. You can see that this is the extent of the Washington south projection, EPSG 2927, pretty similar. Um, all we do one line, everything else is the same. Um, and this is the same map, but with a web Mercator projection. Those of you who are paying attention might notice that these lines are straight across. Versus up here, these lines are a little bit curved if you look across the TSOs indicatrix. Just an indicator that the web Mercator has straight lines all the way across it. That's the reason for its aerial distortion. Again, lots of details that are sort of interesting, sort of not. Just wanted to demonstrate to you that different projections are um, different. And also, they're pretty easy to switch around if you do need to play around with what you're doing. Um, and again, I wanted to demonstrate one more thing, and that is that um, this software that I'm that I've used to create this is written up in a full tutorial which you can click on this link go, go click on the Cardopy projections um, notebook and you will get a fully written out example which shows you all of these things in a slightly different way here are some more fun projections with the indicatrices on them uh, yeah so you can you can if you or feel like you're lost you feel like you want to follow up on this it's all here for you okay Moving right along. Um, what we're going to do here now is we're actually going to do a live coding example. So I'm going to um, run through this just quickly. I'm going to demonstrate what we're going to do and show you the plots we're going to make, and then I'm actually going to make them um, just to see, to show you how this works. So what we're going to do here is we're actually going to join some actual data in with the cartographic projections that we now learned how to do. Um, what we're going to use to load in some actual data is this really excellent library called GeoPandas. If you're a Python user, you're probably aware of a, a package called Pandas, which is a um, really excellent um, like sort of tabular data manipulation uh, software or package. And um, the GeoPandas ex uh, package is just a geospatial extension to that. Uh, so we're going to be us using this package to load it in. I think you guys have a GeoPandas um, yeah, the next the next tutorial is on GeoPandas itself. Um, I don't know what Nicola was trying to tell me something, but we'll we'll follow up on that. Uh, it's coming, so there's going to be a, a Pandas tutorial coming up uh, in the future, so you'll learn the details about this. Uh, but anyway, I'm just going to use it. It's really simple. All it's doing here for me is reading in a file. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take some data and we're going to plot it on a map using a projection that we're interested in. Um, I'm going to load the data. I'm going to do this in person so you guys can see me doing it. I'm going to decide on a projection. I'm going to plot these data, and we're going to get a map that looks like this. These are all the lakes the Olympic Peninsula. Down here, I'm going to decide, hey, listen, you know, that's a cute map and everything, but I'd really like to know more information about where these places are on the Earth. And so what I'm going to do is just add a little bit of context to that map, and we're going to get a map that eventually looks like this, which uh, is just all of the maps on the Olympic Peninsula, or sorry, all the lakes in the Olympic Peninsula. And then if we've got a little bit of time, I'm going to try to do some actual GIS. What I mean by that is I'm just going to try to find the biggest lake in the Olympic Peninsula and then highlight it, which is going to look like this. 
Okay. Um, and live coding is always sort of an adventure, so hopefully uh, everything will work. We'll see. Um, I'm going to open up a, a new Jupyter Notebook. You guys are also going to either have or will learn about uh, Jupyter Notebooks in the future. Um, really excellent way to sort of just in, interact with a uh, live environment here that you can play around with and, and share with other people. I'm just going to load Cardopy, the feature, and the CRS um, packages here. And I'm also going to load uh, Geopandas uh, similarly so we can get at it. Um, I've got a data file, which is called um, lakes. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say the lakes um, are equal to geopandas.read file. And I'm going to give it the name um, of the file, which is Oli Lakes. And it's a shape file. Um, so we'll lo load that in. And then we can say, just I say, give me the head of it. We can get the first five rows. This is what the data look like. Uh, they've got some of these. You know, this is from the National Hydrography data set. Um, so there's some pretty standard parameters, which you can look up. And then there's actually a geometry, which represents the spatial geometry of the um, of each lake. If you want to see what that looks like, you can say lakes.geometry. And we can just get the first one. And that's a lake, believe it or not. Um, we can get a random one, another lake. So this is what those geometries look like. They're just spatial geometries of lakes. Um, what we want to do is we just want to plot all of these on a map. So what we're going to have to do is we just have to set up um, a set of axes. Now, what I didn't do above is I didn't import any of the sort of plotting machinery I needed. Pi plot, and we're going to do a little um, magic command here that allows me to actually view the plots in line in this notebook here. Um, so going back just to to um, here, all we need to do is we need to decide, define a set of axes with a given projection. I've decided that the Lambert conformal projection is the one I want to use because I, I like it. So I'm going to say our axes are going to be in the Lambert conformal projection. Okay. You can see that that will give you a blank Lambert conformal projection with nothing on it. What we have to do in this Jupyter Notebook is we have to actually write all the plotting commands in a single cell so that they will plot together. So I have to just edit this single cell over and over again. Going back here, all I want to do is now add all the geometries to the map. So there are two things that are, that are involved in that. The first is this add geometries function. It's a member function of the geospatial axes that we just made, and it takes the geometry of the data frame that we loaded in, it takes the coordinate reference system of the source data, in this case it's latitude and longitude data, and then it takes a whole variety of other parameters which we can get into later. So that's step one, is this add geometries function. But when you just use add geometries, it, it plots the whole projection with the data on it. But we don't actually want in a little bit. So we set the extent of the map using this function of, that's a member function of the actual data set called total bounds, which gives us a bounding box. We separate the pieces out of that bounding box into bottom left, top left, et cetera. Extent of the map using this axes.setExtent function. And so I'm just going to uh, write all that out. I'm going to copy this guy because I can never remember what the indices are. So what I'm going to do is say axes.addGeometries, and I'm going to say lakes. I'm going to say that the source coordinate reference system is a plate car projection. Oops. Um, I'm going to say that the edge color of my lakes is blue, because that seems like what you would do. Um, and the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to skip the, the bounds. And I'm going to set the extent using those bounds. So we'll run this. And there's a whole, there's a quite a large number of uh, lakes in this data set, so it's going to take on the order of 10 to 15 seconds to actually run. Um, but here you have it. So these are all the lakes on the Olympic Peninsula. Now, you're like, wow, that's a really small map. I would really like it to be larger. You might remember that previously in the, uh, in the tutorial, I had this extra line here that said figure equals plt.figure, and then I said fig size. And I can give, you can give a size. 
So we can create the figure size, and this is slightly larger. So here's our figure one. These are all the lakes from the National Hydrography data set in the Olympic Peninsula. Um, okay, but you might be saying, well, that's great, but I'd really like some coastlines and maybe some you know, land cover or something like that. Um, this is where the, uh, the um, Cardopi feature uh, comes in. Oh, and I forgot one thing. I forgot to add grid lines, but we'll do that later. So we want to add some context, and this is where the Cardopi feature module really shines. There's this module, part of the Cardopi feature module, called the natural earth feature function. This does, you can specify an, a data set from the natural earth data set. It will download that data and add it to your map really, really simply without having to worry about downloading, unzipping, storing your shape files. It does all that work for you. Um, so we'll go back here and um, we'll grab this land. So this is, it's a, it's a physical data set. It's called the land data set. It's at a 10 meter scale. The Cardopi feature has a little list, a dictionary in it called colors, which has some standard cartographic colors. Um, and so we'll grab that data set. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go up and just copy all of this here because, as I said, we have to have all the plotting code in the same, uh, same cell. And the only thing that I need to do here that's different is I need to say X. And as soon as it does, we'll get um, a map with the land and the lakes on it. Now, what's probably going to happen is that it might plot the land on top of the lakes, so we might not actually see the lakes. And there's a way that we can fix that. Um, uh, worked. Excellent. So here's um, the Olympic Peninsula. There's the Puget Sound. Seattle's over here somewhere. Um, Olympic National Park is right in the middle here. And there are some lakes. So there's our, there's our map with the lakes on them. But let's say you want to do a little more. Learn about um, which is the biggest lake in the Olympic Peninsula. And actually, those of you who are uh, really keen might be looking at this thing over here, and you're like, there's something wrong. Like, these lakes are in the middle of the Puget Sound. Um, there's actually an island there, but this 10-meter land data set doesn't quite cover. Let's say we wanted to know what the biggest lake in the in the um, in the uh, this data set is. So if you look, what we can do is we can say lakes, and this will come up in your GeoPandas tutorial later on. Um, we can say lakes.columns, and we can see what kind of data we. And you can see very conveniently we have an area square kilometer uh, column. If you didn't have that though, what you could do is you could do lakes.geometry.area. We'll just get the first five or something. And it actually give, it will calculate the degrees. I'm not exactly sure how to describe the unit. Because the area is computed in the coordinate reference system of the data, these aren't immediately interpretable. But they are still relatively accurate. So you could use that uh, depending, uh, depending, depending, depending about your coordinate reference system. For Reproject your data into uh, like a, a UTM coordinate system or something like that, but that's outside of the scope of this tutorial. Anyway, very conveniently, we have lakes dot area square kilometer, which for every lake gives us the uh, square kilometers that the lake is. So what we can do, and we can say by area square kilometers, and we can say that I do not want it to be ascending. I want to start with the biggest one. And so there's our data set, starting with the biggest lake, which we've just learned is Ozette Lake in the Olympic Peninsula. So you're like, OK, well, I'd like to see Ozette Lake highlighted on my map. So what we'll do is we'll get the first one, which is Ozette Lake. And we'll just do that by calling the head function with just one. There are other ways to do that, but that's the most convenient. And so what we'll do is we'll go up and we'll grab this code here, which we just wrote for our most recent plot. We'll paste it here. I'm sure you guys can guess what the next thing to do is. Axe.add geometries. We're going to add the biggest lake geometry. We still have to do the CRS equals plate car. And this time I'm going to say edge color is red. And I actually don't want it to be filled in because I want to see the blue underneath uh, the red. 
So I'm going to say none because we already have it's already going to be plotted on the map because of this line up here. So I don't want to plot it twice if we don't have to. I'm going to actually add another parameter here called z order, and I'm going to put it to a large number. Z order just tells Matplotlib what where in the stack of things that are plotted on the same point of the map, where do you want them to be vertically, so to speak. Um, z order of 20 will put this red outline on top of everything else that's already been plotted on the map. Um, let's see if it works. Well, oh, didn't work. Great. Excellent. Wouldn't be a live coding example without an error. Let's see what it says. It says unknown property fill color. That's right. <clears throat> so to fix that problem, we're going to go look and see what it actually is, which is down here. And you can see that it's actually called face color and not fill color. And I forgot that I also wanted a line width. So we'll copy that. Put it in there, and we'll try that out. Okay, so there's Ozette Lake. It's highlighted in red with the blue color underneath it. So that's nice. Let's say we want to put a label. Those of you who have used um, <clears throat> Matplotlib before know that there's an axe.txt um, function. And I just want to make sure I get this right because I always forget what it is. What we're going to do is we're actually going to use the centroid of this geometry, which we can get um, using the centroid function or the centroid member of the largest lake. And I'm going to add a little bit of an offset so it's not directly in the middle. I'm going to pull the name of the lake out of the data using this GNIS name values. And I'm just going to uh, use the axes.txt uh, to add that data. And this is not Big Lake, but in fact, it's called Biggest Lake. You can see that even when we add text, I don't know if you can't see that. You can see even when we add text to the map, we still have to tell it what the coordinate reference system of the coordinates that we want the text to be placed at are in. So I know that because this data set is in the latitude longitude projection and I'm providing the centroid, those data are in latitude longitude coordinate reference system, which means I need to tell this um, axe.txt function to transform the data using the plate car projection. So if we run that, we will see that we've got Ozat Lake right there on our map. So that is basically a pretty easy and simple live coding example. Using some water data, we use this uh, national hydrography data set of lakes, which comes as a shape file. I just cropped it a little bit using GeoPandas earlier, um, but you could have done this whole data set. You could have done this um, example using the entire NHD lakes data set. It just would have taken a very long time to run because there's a lot of lakes in that data set. Um, but you could have made a map of every single lake in the continental United States if you desire. Um, so that is the um, point at which we're going to stop this tutorial. Um, but I want to just illustrate for the next couple of minutes um, where you might go from here if you want to continue your uh, education on this topic. And so the first thing I will point you to is if you go to this Back to this tutorial, you will find the one that I referenced earlier when we were talking about projections. You will find that actually this whole example that we've been working on is uh, written out fully down here. Um, I used a different data set, and actually I don't know if it ran here, but I used a different data set. Um, I used a national parks data set, but you could do this on your own um, to do this example before. So it's just a practical example of using real data and GeoPandas. Um, so that's something you can do. In addition, in this in the visualization notebooks folder, there's also a uh, a tutorial called Folium tutorial, and I want to just touch on that for just a minute, and I'll open it up here so you can see it uh, in practice. This Folium is an actually an interactive mapping library for Python, where you can create actual maps that you can scroll around in your browser. Um, and this tutorial is available online. You can run it. Um, and I, if I run it here, here's an example of me put, taking a little marker and putting it on Mount Rainier where Camp Muir is. Um, so this whole um, tutorial is an example of how you might add uh, geospatial data, which isn't only limited to uh, markers. You can also add shape files and things like that to an interactive zoomable map, which you can actually save and then uh, share with others.
So if you're interested in interactive maps, you can go follow this tutorial. It's fairly straightforward and is uh, fully written out. And then finally, um, as we're moving forward, uh, you can look at you can look through this interactive tutorial, but it interactive maps tutorial, but it just links to the notebook. And then here I mentioned a couple other powerful plotting tools that some of you may already have experience with. For example, if you um, are aware of ArcGIS or QGIS, those are other, uh, of course, very powerful geospatial visualization tools um, that are less programmatic, but that you can do. But another one that's actually quite surprising is Tab free. Typically, it's like a $3,000 a year piece of software. But uh, if you're an academic, you can use it for free. This is a visualization that I made using um, uh, wilderness areas in the United States paired with uh, when the wilderness area was designated. And this is actually an interactive visualization. So you can click on 1980 and see all of the wilderness areas that were designated in 1980. You can see how uh, 1980 was a big year for wilderness designation in the United States because the total area of wilderness in acres has increased significantly over the period of time there. So this, put, this took me an hour and a half to put together. Um, and that's, I do have quite a bit of experience with Tableau, but it's a very powerful tool, even for geospatial data visualization, which I think it gets a, a bad rap for. it. Um, so that's yet another example of something that you can look into, and they've got a lot of good tutorials on their website. So now we can do questions. Thank you, Tony, for the great tutorial today. And let's take a look at some questions. You guys can feel free to ask a question if you've got any. Seems like there are no questions. Don't think so. Oh. Um, yeah, so if you have a question that you'd like to ask, you can type it into the chat box on the uh, GoToWebinar um, software that's running on your computer. Where it says type message here. Here's a question uh, for you, Tony, um, from Leslie. Have you run into limitations of Tableau in the, in the size of the data set you're using? Yes, uh, that's a good point, Leslie. It's certainly uh, limited in that way. Um, if you've got a lot of geospatial data, Tableau is quite slow at processing it. Um, and it also doesn't have any facilities for any sort of GIS processing. So your data has to be pretty clean when you're bringing it in. It can't do any sort of reprojection or anything like that for you. Um, so I will say that it's somewhat limited and you have to do some pre-processing steps beforehand. Like this data set, for example, that I used for the wilderness data, um, I had to do quite a bit of pre-processing before to make it all load into to, um, to Tableau, but I did all that pre-processing in GeoPandas and Python. Um, so doing that one step isn't wasn't terribly challenging, um, and was I was able to augment the data such that Tableau was more happy about it. Um, but there is certainly a limitation there. Thank you. Here's a um, question from Aaron. How would you plot time varying lake areas? Do source data sets exist as a function of time, seasonal, annual, for example? And how and what Python module would you interact with a time varying map? Yeah, so there's a couple of things I can think of there. Um, in terms of um, moving, in terms of understanding lake areas over time, that, that sounds like a, a pretty decent uh, research project that you might undertake. I know that there are certainly folks who are working on that from a remote sensing perspective. So there's lots of, uh, I know that there's some folks uh, who are using machine learning and some um, pretty frequently captured remote sensing imagery to find lake boundaries and then calculating areas um, using using the geometries of the lake boundaries from remote sensed imagery. Um, in terms of data sets, I'm not sure those are easily to, easy to come by, but certainly certainly there are people working on that. If you wanted to visualize change, you could either, I see that a couple ways, you could make a static map, which has uh, the different lake boundaries overlaid upon each other. So I'd imagine that you would be able to visualize how the shape of the lake has changed over time, for example. Um, 
with some sort of transparency that, that allows you to see all of the boundaries at once. Um, or you can use quite a, there's quite a few um, tools that exist in Python um, to create interactive visualizations. And so um, one I'm thinking of is called GeoViews, which is a sub-module of HoloViews, which is H-O-L-O -O Views. Um, it's quite a, it's a hefty package to learn how to use, but it's a very, very powerful data visualization platform, which allows you to create visualizations that you can actually interact with, things like sliders, you can zoom in, zoom out. Um, Geo, I've used GeoViews in the past to visualize like like a 300 million data points, and it uh, it actually loads the data as you zoom around, so you, it doesn't have to plot all of the points at once. It'll actually only plot the ones that are visible to you. So it has these sort of optimizations for viewing large amounts of data uh, and can express change over time, too. Thank you, Tony. This is a question from Christina. Um, what are the first steps to run the code in the visualization repository? and to recreate the maps you made in this lecture? That's a great question, Christina. Um, so so to, run the, um, to run the code in the visualization repository, it's gonna be important that you um, attend the tutorials about uh, Conda. Do we have a Conda tutorial? No, or a G, the, we have a yes. Jupyter tutorial? We had a little bit of Jupyter. Okay, week. so being able to run the, the code requires um, using, having a software package installed called uh, Jupyter, which is a, a command line utility that um, creates what's called uh, a Jupyter notebook. And Jupyter allows you to, um, to interact with these, these notebook files. Um, when you learn about Git, which will be a, a tutorial that either you've had already or you're gonna have in the future, um, you'll be able to clone this repository, the tutorial contents repository that I mentioned. And then once you have that, you'll actually have all the notebook files. And then you'll have to use um, some sort of package manager like pip, or Conda to install the dependencies like Cardopy and GeoPandas. Um, if those words are confusing to you, then um, hopefully we'll be able to answer those questions privately or in, in person. Um, for the most part, the steps are install Jupyter, download the necessary packages to run the code, which are Cardopy and GeoPandas, and then um, clone the repository to your computer. Thank you, Tony. Here's another question from Zahar. Does it have any option for upscaling bigger data to reduce them in size? Um, I wonder, I don't know when you wrote that, Zahra. Um, I don't know what, <clears throat> maybe you're talking about, um, if you want to follow up on that, you're welcome to. <laughs> I'm looking at the questions now. Um, so I think it, you might be mentioning, um, Upscaling bigger data to reduce that. Um, so maybe like taking a complicated data set and making it simpler so that it can uh, it can be reduced in size. There are functions in GeoPandas, for example, that can do that. There's a there's a function in GeoPandas called uh, oh shoot, I think it's called Simplify, which just takes a polygon with lots of points and removes points in such a way that the shape of the polycon is maintained, but it just has fewer points that describe it. And you can, there's also options about what that means to you, like what a shape, what does keeping the shape the same mean? Um, so there are certainly ways to take very large geospatial data and scale it down so that it has fewer representative points, which means that the data files are smaller. Okay, well, thank you for your questions. And thank you, Tony, again for the great seminar. Uh, we will meet um, next week for the next seminar in the series that we will, Emilio and Ifran will deliver. And it would be on data access and time series. Um, I hope we jo you join us again next time. Have a good day. Thank Thanks, you. Guys.